a vote of thanks. And by friendly buyer, what's meant is that you make some specifications that are realistic. You have a competition to see who can deliver the hardware, and then try in the process of the development of the hardware to come to terms to make sure that what is delivered is useful and consistent with the need of the user. In many cases, the computers would arrive at either Livermore or Los Alamos somewhat devoid of operating software, and Sid and his colleagues at the other laboratories would end up helping develop the software that has made them useful. So to some extent, it's been a heck of a good investment from the point of view of the, the United States government in the other areas that have benefited from this. If you're running a company and you're running an IR&D committee, one of the things you always ask is whether or not you're getting your money's worth. And you have to look and see what the return on investment is. And the number of supercomputers that have been sold and used, and the number of people who are employing in other activities now, uh, is such that they're generating taxes which are probably well repaying the investment that was made on the part of government in order to do it, discounting completely the benefit in terms of the cost savings in, in designing nuclear weapons and their uh, related systems. The growth of use of supercomputers has invaded other areas, one of which that Sid didn't mention, I thought was kind of interesting, that is movies that you see now, things like Tron and so on, uh, have benefited, and a lot of the animation that's taking place is taking place as a result of, of um, using these. And of course, he's mentioned aeronautics and astrophysics and so on. One of the things I wanted to touch on in my time is that in the last two or three years that some of us have been worrying about this problem from within government have been concerned, as have been many people on the outside, uh, about several issues. And these have kind of been condensed into some shorthand terminology. One is a so-called access problem, and the other is what Sid's already mentioned, the next generation of uh, super number cruncher, and then generally speaking, the artificial intelligence or the tech base uh, kind of issue. For reasons that aren't entirely clear as to how it came about, there was formed a Federal Coordinating Council on Science, Engineering, and Technology, which is part of the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, was formed to look into these problems. And, and we discussed this for a while and then formed some subcommittees, and those subcommittees prepared reports. And those reports have served the, as the basis for uh, testimony that I and, and uh, Jay Keyworth and others have, have given. Those reports are available. Those of you who are interested in the subject, I'd suggest looking at them. They do contain a wealth of information, uh, the sort of the number of supercomputers and the other technical things. One of the interesting things that came out in that was that of the 70 to 80 supercomputers that have been manufactured and, and uh, sold, that only 10% <coughs> of those have gone into universities anywhere. And of those, there are only three that are at universities in the United States. So the universities in the United States, at least in terms of direct utilization, don't have um, supercomputers in an environment where they are physically close by, although I think many people now are debating whether or not that really is an essential essential feature, but that's getting taken up in, in other uh, arenas. I think in part the concern was not just the Japanese problem. I think there's a tendency for us to kind of collectively over-focus on the, on the foreign threat aspect of this, but rather just our national economy and other general aspects of the way we do business and the kinds of things we do, I don't think we've taken proper advantage of utilizing computers not only for scientific problems but for other kinds of problems that relate to, uh, <coughs> relate to these things. This is true in, in areas with which I'm involved, which are high energy physics and nuclear physics and the, and the life, uh, life sciences. I think they, that the people involved in those fields have looked around and seen that to some extent the government has not been supporting access to supercomputers in a way that would be encouraging to them to take on not the problems that they kind of have in their back pocket, but the problems that they would really like to address, but look at and see that unless there was access to the right kind of computational capability, they wouldn't have a chance of coming to a solution in a realistic period of time, uh, probably having to do with the length of time it takes you to get promoted for assistant to full professor in most of our universities. But the professors and scientists are no different than anyone else. You like to work on something, in which on some kind of a 
time scale, and that time scale has to do with kind of your own career base. And if you're talking about taking on a problem that you have zero chance of solving in your entire career lifetime, chances are you won't touch it. So there is a certain challenge time that uh, that's involved in these things. And I think we have, there are problems of national and scientific interest that have not been addressed simply because the access was inadequate and that something should be um, should be done. So I'm worried a little bit about the problems that aren't even getting uh, getting attention. Now what what is DOE doing about this at the moment? Well, DOE still has something like 13 of the uh, Cray and uh, Cyber supercomputers in its uh, collection of computers that are made available. Most of those are made available to individuals in the weapons programs for calculations related to weapons activities. Uh, Two of them are part of the Magnetic Fusion Computer Center, which is located at Livermore. And in view of that programs being part of the programs I'm responsible for, what I've done in the last two years is to make about 5% of the time at that computer system available to other DOE contractors who are involved in research in high energy physics and nuclear physics. We plan to extend that capability to uh, depending on how things happen in the, this uh, budget cycle, to essentially one full additional Cray computer to be utilized by those populations. Now, that doesn't solve the national access problem, that the number of graduate students, the number of faculty members, and so on that need access to supercomputers is much larger than that. But I think this problem is so pervasive that it really doesn't matter who gets at solving it. And to some extent, it should be DOD, NSF, DOE, and the other agencies, NASA, who have the capability of providing access through whatever means to the populations of individuals that are engaged in scientific work or technical work that's of interest to them, and that this really should be broadly solved. If we overcompensate for a while, I don't think that that's uh, likely to be too, too serious. Well, in, in these kinds of areas where science and science technology are involved, you're all aware of the deficit and its size and what a pervasive influence that has and the fact that it is necessary to make some choices among various scientific options and so on. And we really can't do everything. But I do believe that this is one of those areas in which it's just absolutely essential that the United States not relinquish its lead in this field if it can possibly avoid it. This is a field the United States had a dominant influence in causing to come into existence. It is a material interest to us in our national security and scientific activities, and I don't think we should relinquish the lead to anyone without one heck of a fight. And we have some resources for the department this year to do this, and I know the other agencies do as well, and uh, I hope we all make it through the budget season that is going to begin, at least for me, tomorrow on the Hill. Uh, successfully in defending these, these budgets. Uh, the agencies and the uh, administration, I think, have been very supportive of trying to do something about this area, recognizing it's a problem and addressing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Dr. Kenneth Wilson, is a professor of physics at the Newman Laboratory at Cornell University and the 1982 Nobel Laureate in, in Physics. <coughs> See, do I have to, do I turn on the slides here or? Well, I am not an engineer, I'm a physicist, but I'm very proud to represent the IEEE on this occasion and to help celebrate the 100 years of innovation and the efforts of the engineers in improving the quality of life in this country and around the globe. I should say, first of all, we're dealing with a very complex issue. Uh, I have a paper written in the IEEE proceedings for this January for those of you who want to explore the subject in depth. In fact, that whole issue is devoted to the supercomputer problem. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to bring you a rather different message than you've heard from the previous two speakers. And the basis for the message that I'm bringing you is the computer revolution that is taking place today. 
Any of you who have recently bought personal computers are well aware of the kind of revolution that is taking place. And it means that the future is genu genuinely different from the past. And what you've heard from the previous speakers is the supercomputer problem as it has developed from the past. But I, I agree that we are in a supercomputer race with Japan, but I want to focus attention on the question of what do we want supercomputers for in the United States? In other words, what is our goal? And what do we do to reach that goal? But the f first thing I want to say is the following, that there is a question that is in the air right now and probably will be decided, certainly in the next few months, perhaps in the next few weeks. And the question is, do we as a country move ahead rapidly, incur lots of risks to try to reach the goal that I will discuss, or do we go slowly? Do we measure every step? Do we take time to correct mistakes? Unfortunately, the, the situation at present is that there are a number of people, myself included, who are ready to go on the fast track on this issue. And we have already started projects that assume that the fast track is going to develop, that assumes that the country is going to back a major push forward in supercomputers. So there are projects at Cornell, there are projects at the University of Illinois, there are projects inside the computing industry, which I obviously have to be very careful about discussing. There are projects I see in every visit that I've made to industrial users of computing. There are projects there that cannot succeed unless supercomputers are supplied to the industries I visited. So there's a community of people in industry, in universities, and in government that are ready to move, are already moving, but they need a signal that they're going to be backed. And I will come later to what that signal has to be. And as I said, th that signal, if it comes, is in the next few months. And if that signal does not come, it will be, the efforts that are now underway will collapse, and it will take several years to recover the momentum that is now developing. What is our goal, the goal for the U.S. in working with supercomputers? I believe the goal is to expand the creativity of the U.S. economy. I am talking about the kind of creativity which we are celebrating here today, the creativity which produced the light bulb, the telegraph, the transistor, the optical fiber, the fantastic discoveries which our entire economy depends on. Building the creativity of our economy for the future is, in my view, more important than questions of tax policy, trade policy, dealing with a deficit, struggling with all the stupidities that go on in this town. <laughs> and I remind you that underlying all these problems is we have problems, and so does Japan, the, of trying to support Social Security, Medicaid, defense. And we have to strengthen our economy as we have never done before to deal with those issues. And that's independent of who's in office here in Washington. But that's not the only issue. The, the other issue is with supercomputers, as I will discuss, we can make life more exciting, more interesting. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Now, I'll see if I can run the slide projector. Okay. Can someone focus it a little better? Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to discuss five topics which I've squeezed, squeezed out as a general problem which I hope comes to, at least gives you an idea of the essence. Uh, the need for supercomputers is in the thousands. And they're needed in virtually every industry that I've been able to visit, in oil, in automobiles, in aerospace, in chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. 
But to, before industry will go full bore in bringing in supercomputers to, as I say, enhance creativity, supercomputers have to come for a reasonable price. That's the second topic. To, to build, not only to build the supercomputers, but to build the usage of supercomputers to make them effective in the U.S. economy requires cooperation. It requires, and I'll discuss that in more detail, and I will call your attention to a form of cooperation which is in the public domain, but you may not be aware of it since it involves IBM. Then I will discuss the government role. You've already heard from the Department of Energy. You will hear from the Department of Defense. So from the government's point of view, I will be representing the role of the National Science Foundation. And, but it's in respect to the National Science Foundation that I think the green light has to come. I'll discuss that. And then I'll come back to what I think is really the crux of the whole matter, the role of supercomputers in creativity. We have to understand why industry needs supercomputers. And it is in one word, speed. In the computing industry today, they can test a design for a system with hundreds of thousands of transistors. And I don't know whether the time scale is minutes or hours. I don't actually work with these design tools myself. But the, but the reduction in time it takes to test a computer design today compared to actually going out and building that computer is incredible. And that's because of the speed of the most powerful computers we have today. And because you can test a design in minutes or in a very short time, you, you can change the design and you can test it again and you can change the design and then you can test it again. You can optimize the design. And that means that we get better computers today. In fact, <coughs> the use of com <coughs> large computers to test computer designs is so critical now to the computing industry that if you pull the plugs on all the computers used in the computer industry itself, technology development in computers would cease. They could mainly, maybe still manufacture the computers that are already designed in, in the factory floor, but you wouldn't get any new ones. In aircraft design, the aircraft industry is not quite so dependent on simulation as the computer industry is. But even so, it, they make enormous strides, as was described by the previous speaker in areas such as fuel efficiency of airplanes by, by, again, being able to test designs and go back and put in new alternatives into the design process and try them out again. In oil prospecting, the oil industry spends incredible amounts of computing to <coughs> search for oil by what's called seismic prospecting. And they, they have to anal analyze enormous amounts of data going along with that in order to try to improve the chance of finding oil rather than drilling a hole which is dry. And you already heard about movie color graphics. Now when you go to industry, what you find is that there are people in industry who want supercomputers. You find industries that have bought supercomputers. But they have had terrible trouble because of the price of supercomputers. The, the, the research people who want a supercomputer get in an argument with the accounting people who ask, what is the yearly payback schedule on that $10 million that you propose to spend? And the argument becomes undecidable because the research people can't get their research done without it, but nobody can supply the accounting people with a payback schedule. And the managers in industry are caught in the middle. And the argument goes right up to the chairman of the board. And the managers hate the term supercomputer because it's meant so much trouble for them. If you could bring the price of supercomputers down to something around $500,000, industry would buy them by the thousands, just as they buy thousands of 
Computers in roughly that price range today from IBM, Digital Equipment Corp, and so forth for scientific and engineering use. Now, I believe that thanks to the incredible developments now in computer components and integrated circuits achieved by members of the IEEE, that the $500,000 supercomputer is technologically feasible. But I am not a computer designer. I remind you of that. I'm just a user of computers. And so I would like to have somewhat better authority for that statement than myself. But we get into the difficulty that talking about what could be done, we get into the question of the future product strategy of the industry, which is an extremely sensitive issue. But I have persuaded the president of ETA Systems, just mentioned by Sidney Fernbach, to give me a statement to at least give you some sense of what is now possible. And I will simply read you this statement, which is from ETA Systems, Inc. In a recent discussion, Lloyd Thorndike, president of ETA Systems, Inc., a new supercomputer company, confirmed that ETA's level of LSI design technology creates an opportunity to develop a compatible standalone supercomputer workstation. That means a smaller computer, but which runs the same software as their proposed GF10. For example, ETA's LSI technology allows a reduction in components of 100 to 1 over previous designs. The question facing ETA, said Thorndike, is not one of techno technology capability, but whether the requirements of researchers, advanced algorithms developers, and users exist for this near supercomputer compatible workstation. In summary, said Thorndike, ETA's technology advancements will continue to create new opportunities for development of products that could be applicable to a large market segment that previous technology could not address. You can address inquiries to Mr. B. Robertson of ETA Systems Incorporated, and I have the address. So what I claim is that because of the developments, and because in this statement he refers to the 100 to 1 reduction in the parts count, you can bring the techniques of mass production, of investment in chip design, to reduce the unit costs of the computers that are produced well below the cost of producing a Cray-1 or a CDC-205 today. And what the US has to do is take advantage of that fact. Now, if we're talking about $500,000 supercomputers, we're talking about an enormously different market from the traditional supercomputer market. Enormously larger, and therefore bringing in different players than have been discussed so far. Just talking within the computer industry itself, obviously if this is mainly a business use of supercomputers, you start by thinking about IBM, the principal computer manufacturer that tries to meet US industrial demands for computers of all kinds. There is a manufacturer who has not been mentioned so far called Floating Point Systems. They come in at 91st on the datamation list of computing companies. But there was the first computer manufacturer that came close to computer supercomputer speeds at a reasonable price. Their first computer was 100 times faster than competitively priced mini computers. But we also are talking about Cray Research, ETA Systems, and Denocor with their years of experience with supercomputers. And of course, this being the US, there's always the possibility of new companies coming into the game. Now, I can't go into full details in all the kinds of cooperation that's needed here. But what I would like to emphasize is, is that there is a start on which we can build and that start is a marketing agreement between IBM and Floating Point Systems. That is to say that 
the IBM salesman can actually call in floating point system salesmen to try to jointly configure a system for their customers. And if that kind of cooperation can be expanded, if we can have IBM collaborating with other members of US industry on the marketing side, that is looking at the needs of customers and trying to bring the products of the computing industry so that they meet those customers' needs, I think that would be fantastic. But cooperation is much larger than just IBM and floating point systems. There is a community of people engaged in the use of supercomputers, in the building of supercomputers, or more generally just in large-scale scientific computing. And this really is a community, even though they're scattered among different societies, industry or universities, different disciplines. But you can take any two people from this community and you put them in one room and within seconds they're talking shop to each other. But we've got to bring that community together and enable them to work together. I come to the role of the National Science Foundation. What supercomputers are often used for is to make predictions. Make predictions about how a particular design will operate, be it a computer design, be it an aircraft design. And to make these predictions, you must know scientific, you must have scientific understanding. You must how, un understand how electrons go around in circuits, how atoms make up a material, or how air flows past a wing. To carry out these calculations requires the use of the past 300 years of scientific research and engineering research. And for some of the problems being studied today, uh, we need to compress the next 300 years of scientific research into about a decade. In other words, we have to achieve an acceleration of scientific research that would make enormous progress occur over the next 10 years. And this scientific research and the applications of the scientific research requires trained scientists and engineers at the PhD level and even beyond the PhD. And so that's where the NSF comes in, sponsoring the basic research and sponsoring the training of the people that industry is going to require if we're going to use supercomputers effectively. The NSF has an initiative to try to get started in bringing large-scale computation into the universities in a major way. Unfortunately, the official budget proposal is $20 million. The green light that would signal starting the country on the fast track, starting the industry on the fast track to producing computers, starting the universities to train the people, getting the private industry going and using them is if Congress raises that amount, I would like to see them raised to $100 million, but I think the important thing is that Congress goes above the $20 million that's in that budget. And now, I would just like to say to close um, that the importance of supercomputers is to help the creative process, to help people not only achieve flashes of brilliance, but to translate that brilliance into real products in the complex environment that we live today. And the importance of the supercomputer is to give response to people on the time scale on which they want a response, which is seconds, not minutes, not hours. And that kind of response to help creativity is needed in every walk of life uh, science, movies. I invite you to think of applications in the news business where you would like to get a job done in seconds that now takes you months. And I predict that you, confidently that you too will be using supercomputers in the future. Thank you.
Thank you for the challenge, Ken. I'm sure many here will take you up on that. Our final speaker this afternoon is Dr. Robert Cooper, who's the director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Bob? See, I'm not quite sure why I'm on this uh, agenda with you folks this afternoon. Uh, Defense is a prolific user of computers, almost none of which are supercomputers. There's a long and involved history of why that um, situation obtains, and I won't bore you with the details of it, but basically, aside from the computers that are used in the Department of Energy laboratories to design nuclear weapons, which I guess you could consider a defense application, although uh, they perhaps better belong to the Department of Offense rather than the Department of Defense. Uh, and aside from the certain use of machines by the intelligence community, particularly the National Security Agency, so agency which does serve uh, defense purposes, about the only use for supercomputers in defense per se is in numerical weather forecasting and in uh, certain aeronautical research which is done uh, by and for uh, defense. And I, I don't uh, foresee in the near future that that uh, situation will change much, but there is a crying need for advanced computer capabilities in defense and is the basis for a new program that was started by uh, ARPA during this past year. Uh, and that uh, particular thrust is typical of the kind of thrust that you uh, you will find ARPA making, which is to uh, try to project 10 years into the future, not to uh, look at the near-term horizons that are uh, required by uh, the researchers in industry, required of their marketing and of their uh, general management, but to instead to look beyond, to look at the, at the needs for defense computation in the decade, beyond the decade, in which we now exist. Basically, what is that need? As we see it in defense, the need will be for uh, an ability to, to create computers which can essentially magnify the power of uh, both strategic and tactical weapon systems of that era. The reason is clear, and that is because our adversaries, particularly those in the Warsaw Pact, are outspending us by substantial sums in every major weapon system area. And by and large, the capability of the weapon systems uh, being produced in the Soviet Union is increasing and is increasingly comparable in, its, in their very capability to uh, our weapon systems of today. So we will find ourselves, uh, if we project into the 1990s, in a in a particularly poor adversarial position with respect to the Soviet Union, they will have capable systems in numbers far superior to the numbers of our systems. Consequently, the feeling is that, that the only way that, uh, that we can deal with that problem is to build the capability of our systems substantially. And the power of our systems, the complexity of those systems, will demand a new kind of uh, computer uh, be created. Now those computers, I suppose you will be able to call them supercomputers, but perhaps they would be better called super intelligent computers. And the thrust of ARPA's research program, will, which will be substantial, is probably more comparable to the Japanese fifth generation program, of which Sid Fernbach spoke briefly in his opening remarks, uh, because it will create a new genre of computers that will be able to emulate human thought and be able to help us to control the uh, very complex weapon systems of the 1990s era. It will make it possible for us, hopefully, to magnify the capability of those systems to the point where they will be effective many for one in an engagement with the more conventional weapons which will be fielded by our adversaries in that time period. Now, what is it that makes me believe that it's possible to create uh, super intelligent computers or to create a whole new uh, domain of machine intelligence? Well, there's about 
15 years of um, research precedence, which has uh, converged uh, at this point in time to make it seem quite likely that we will be able to create uh, machines of vast intelligence. The research areas that I'm speaking of are particularly the areas of VLSI design, uh, VLSI systems design, uh, artificial intelligence technology, and a wide variety of supporting uh, research that would support systems uh, uh, based on these uh, fundamental uh, research results of the past 10 years. One of the most exciting and important of these supporting research activities is research into multiprocessor architectures, which will make it possible to combine very capable VLSI chips into systems of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands or even millions of computers operating together uh, on a particular problem. ARPA's uh, research in computer architecture started back in the 1960s and resulted in one of the supercomputers that Sid mentioned, the ILIAC-4, which was built under an ARPA contract and which was really the first very large multiprocessor architecture ever attempted. It had 64 processors and operated at torrid speeds and still is, is uh, uh, considered comparable in its computing power and numerical processing to the class six uh, machines which Sid talked about of the modern era. But it's not the, uh, uh, the numerical processing problem that defense will be faced with, it's the control of complex machinery. And so a new class, or perhaps several classes, of multiprocessor architecture mach machines are envisioned uh, as coming out of this program in the latter part of the 1980s and the early 1990s. I believe that there will be three types, three main types of computers that will be, uh, that will result from this research. One is, is a class of exceedingly fast signal processors, which will be able uh, to be used to, uh, to assess imagery, and image understanding is one of the objectives of this program. Real-time image un understanding of uh, sensor images that may be attached to weapon systems platforms. Another entire class of, of processors that will come out of this program will be a class of symbolic processors that will be, in essence, a uh, a processing overlay for semantic memories, which will essentially contain the knowledge, human knowledge, uh, which will allow the computers to operate uh, much as the operator of any of our military systems would operate, but essentially operate autonomously. And the third class of multiprocessor computers that will come out of this research is general, process, general purpose processors that will be able to uh, manipulate symbols and manipulate ideas and concepts in much the way that human minds uh, manipulate these uh, structures. These three types of computers, when combined in our weapon systems with uh, other research results, which we will be pursuing and which are based on, uh, on recent uh, progress in natural language uh, uh, software systems, in uh, vision systems, in speech understanding systems, and in expert systems of a wide variety um, may make it possible to have what you would term uh, expert uh, system capability. Now the program that we have in mind is going to be a long and arduous program, no doubt. We estimate that it may take seven to 10 years uh, to, to mature this technology to the point where it could be incorporated into weapons systems. In order to drive the technology hard and to treat it more as a focused research program, we intend to follow three major 
uh, military applications as the drivers. We selected these applications carefully because of their inherent properties uh, being somewhat different from one another, but spanning the spectrum of performance that would be required of, um, of intelligent systems. These applications are a fully autonomous land vehicle, which would be completely controlled by uh, a super intelligent computer. Secondly, we would uh, work to achieve a pilot's associate, which would fly with pilots in our most complex military aircraft and under voice control of the pilot would aid him in controlling the many complex systems that exist uh, in the aircraft, uh, particularly at times of duress when uh, the pilot's attention may be diverted from uh, the essential completion of his mission. And finally, we've chosen uh, a battle management problem, which uh, we think stresses the technology, particularly the, the technology associated with the symbolic processors and access to human expert knowledge. The battle management problem that we are favoring right now is control of a naval battle group. And that, pro that uh, problem grows naturally out of uh, experiments that we've done over the past two years on the aircraft carrier Carl Vincent, which have, has used expert systems to control all aspects of flight operations on that carrier and has proven to uh, be able to function as well as the uh, as the combat team, which normally controls uh, aircraft on an aircraft carrier, uh, in carrying out the essential uh, intelligent functions of that operational team. Now, during his comments, uh, Ken Wilson uh, mentioned briefly networking as an essential element of building a research capability in, in uh, supercomputers. Uh, we believe also that continuation of the networking capability that we've built in the computer science establishment in our major universities will be required to carry out this program. And we intend to put into, into being an expanded network capability based on the ARPANET. Uh, it will essentially give access throughout the computer science community to the research machines which will be built under this program. It will also make it possible to exchange information and designs and to do remote computer-aided design of circuits, boards, and even entire VLSI systems. Uh, building on the results of our past research in VLSI design uh, called the MOSES system, uh, we intend to create a rapid turnaround capability for VLSI system design that is comparable to the VLSI uh, chip design that we have now built into MOSES, where a very complex VLSI design can be turned around in times as short as uh, two to three weeks. We in intend to be able to extend that to uh, the similar turnaround for board design, and finally, uh, hopefully similar turnaround for entire prototype systems uh, to uh, test out rapidly ideas that uh, we have in machine intelligence technology. Now, this is a very exciting program. The Congress authorized in FY84 $50 million to begin the program. The President has included in his FY85 budget a request for uh, the expenditure of $95 million in the 85 budget year, uh, we expect that, that this program will grow to a level of about $150 million per year and continue at that level for a number of years uh, until the substantial goals of the program have been met. Now, even though this technology is being uh, pursued for military purposes, it clearly will have major implications uh, in our society as a spin-off technology. Uh, it is our goal to, to combine uh, industrial and commercial enterprises in this research program with the industry and uh, defense 
uh, laboratory research establishments in order to carry out the program. And we expect through that mechanism that much of the research will spin off rapidly into potential commercial applications. We think this is a tremendously uh, important thing for defense. It could turn out to be uh, a, a factor that could transform, finally, this society into the, the information society that, uh, that scientists and engineers have been predicting for the last decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all for covering the uh, supercomputer arena from information society through scientist and engineer and movie production and on. It's time for questions. Yes. For Dr. Cooper, do you see any applications of supercomputers in the uh, uh, space defense system being developed, particularly in the command and control aspects? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, when we uh, created this program during the uh, during, actually during the 1982 year, uh, calendar year, um, the battle management uh, uh, problem that we selected uh, was selected without benefit of the uh, President's speech of last March 23rd, where he advocated uh, defense research on ballistic missile defense. Uh, since that time, we've looked carefully at the possible contributions that uh, machine intelligence may make to a 1990s era uh, space defense system. And we feel that machine intelligence may well be an enabling technology for ballistic missile defense. That is, without success in this area, the complex interactions in a, in a a ballistic missile defense scenario may well not be controllable. The number of elements of the defense system, the complexity of the offensive capability of our adversaries, plus all of the junk and, and uh, penetration aids that one might expect in such a battle would certainly preclude uh, human uh, control of, of uh, such a battle as it evolves over maybe a 10 or 15 minute period of time. So consequently, much, much of the activity is going to have to be under intelligent control of intelligent machines. Um, we are restructuring some of the elements of our program now to meet the essential objectives that the President has set for research generally in this area of uh, strategic defense. Other questions? Yes. Uh, for Dr. Wilson, I was intrigued by something that um, appeared in the program leading up to this meeting, which I think you didn't quite get to in your rush at the end of your comments. You talked about the, the changes that supercomputers might bring to the news business, but I wonder if you could expand on this, um, this note that he here that says, uh, you're, you're going to discuss one of the most extraordinary intellectual undertakings in the history of mankind, the effort to computerize the results of 400 years of scientific inquiry into the laws of nature and how this is going to change scientific research. Okay. Um, it, I mean, I faced the impossible problem of condensing everything into 15 minutes and some things got lost, including the, the subject of the briefing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I feel quite at ease at letting you take some time now that you're off your official schedule. The, uh, <clears throat> so the, the problem is that what you see throughout industry, and I think industry is really driving this process now because the university should be driving it, but the, the lack of computer access makes it difficult for them to do so. But throughout industry, they are trying to apply science to gain better control of the design and manufacturing process, to get products where they can predict in advance what the fuel efficiency will be, what the quality will be, what the product lifetime will be, any, any parameter that you want. And this is going on in, in industries which you might not expect. And you can see this at the Philip Morris company, for example. Um, but they get into incredible scientific problems. I mean, one problem that I saw was the question of 
how do you how do you ensure in advance that a die which is going to stamp out car doors does not stamp out doors that have cracks in them or wrinkles? Well, it turns out the science of how metal cracks and wrinkles is not really very understood yet. And furthermore, when you try to attack this by computer simulation, you have to understand the science. So you have to refer to the whole history of the study of metallurgy. You have to develop some science that even isn't even done yet. And then you have to have extremely powerful computing to put that science into application onto that problem. And, but because you're trying to make a prediction, you're trying to predict how that die will behave, you have to rely on the laws of nature to use that, you know, the laws by which atoms come together to form metal in order to make the predictions and have them come out right. And this attempt to bring science into the industrial design and manufacturing process is occurring in so many areas of industry, in so many scientific areas, that in effect it's the entire history of scientific and engineering inquiry that is at stake. But it has to go into the computer in order to make these predictions, because you can't do it by hand. And what I like to say, to irritate Mr. Cooper here, is that the amount of human intelligence that goes into the big computer programs, like the big structural analysis programs that are already used in industry, the amount of intelligence going into those programs is a lot greater than the total that has been covered in 15 years of artificial intelligence research. We had a question in the back there. Could, 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 I, could I respond uh, to that? Of course. <laughs> So you're absolutely right, Ken. Uh, AI has a long way to go, but uh, you have to realize that it is possible now to in, to essentially capture human intelligence in expert systems in a way that is quite useful for uh, not only for military purposes but for other purposes. And a good example of that is uh, a program that was developed over about a 10-year period of time at Stanford uh, by Josh Letterberg and. Ed Feigenbaum and, and a group of researchers who worked there. And essentially, they codified the knowledge of chemistry, uh, physical chemistry, that uh, was uh, developed by Josh when he was at Columbia University um, for chemical analysis into a, a program that was very, very uh, robust and is one that is used now throughout the, the um, chemical research industry uh, to, to predict the structure of very complex molecules from mass spectrographic results. Now that, that complex expert system is something that was an experimental uh, thing that was derived from artificial intelligence technology. And it can now be um, uh, expanded in its usage to a wide variety of other intellectual disciplines, including those intellectual disciplines having to do with weapon systems. And it's, it's that general thrust that we have in our program. And I, I believe that the capability of these expert systems, plus the uh, very, very uh, capable uh, computers, computer speeds and large-scale memories that, that we will be able to, to build in this program, uh, will certainly be have spectacular results. That is, AI is here and it's it's here to stay. Yes. Would Dr. Fernbach or anyone else care to comment on the potential of the so-called biological or organic molecule computers in this context? I think it's a long, long way off. Oh, they're mass produced by unskilled labor today. <laughs> <laughs> Question over there. Uh, Dr. Cooper, you enthusiastically paint a, a picture of the next decade of work that DARPA plans to do in harmony with industry and uh, with academia on projects that would have wonderful uh, spin-offs into the commercial world. How do you square that with the battle that I understand is raging in the Defense Department about whether to classify portions of your VISIC program? How does this relate to the other kinds of work that you want to do with a commercial uh, world and an academic world? World, what would be your personal view about that particular argument, and what are the implications of the argument uh, for the future? 
That's that's a good question. The, the question really re revolves around the question of export control. As you know, there's been heightened awareness in the Defense Department that the Soviet Union is ben benefiting substantially from by essentially stealing um, technology from this country and using it often more rapidly than we employ it in our weapon systems in their weapon systems. And so that has been a concern and methods, techniques have been developed to try and stem the tide of, of uh, the technology efflux from the United States to the Soviet Union. In the VISIC program, this really has centered on, on the chips themselves, on the product of that research. And the product of that research was intended to be a number of VLSI designs, uh, which were sort of general in nature, that could be useful in a wide variety of weapon systems. And it's not so much the research on the processes or the, the technology that was intended to be protected in this export control method, but the chips themselves and the specific designs that could be used in Soviet radars, Soviet ASW uh, systems, and so on. And so the, the attempt was made, and I think successfully so, to control for export purposes the chips themselves. Now, in the case of, of our program, in the strategic computing program, uh, I believe that toward the end of the period of time when uh, our research is beginning to bear fruit, that there will be some of the products of that research which will have to be controlled. But I think that time is, is far off, and most of the research results will be generic in nature and uh, consequently will not be subject to export control and uh, will certainly be available uh, throughout the industry. Uh, just as the ADA programming language is available today and which was an ARPA program initially and just as much if not most of the of the computer science results uh, that are now uh, obtained on university campuses under ARPA sponsorship are essentially part of the public domain and either are, are available directly or are available under license to the organizations that, uh, that did the research. So I, I don't view that that's going to be a major problem and certainly not in the near term. Yes, sir. I wonder if uh, Dr. Wilson could give us a uh, post-New York Times February 13th update on the competitive race with the Japanese, which was alluded to by yourself as well as by Dr. Fernbach, and I'd also like to have his opinions as well. I'm not the best expert on the race with the Japan because I've not been to Japan since I have felt all along that the real problems were here in the United States and that's where I've been working. Um, however, it seems to me that I would like to emphasize one thing, that creativity is a question usually of a single individual. And if we are supplying them with a supercomputer, it means a supercomputer that is at the command of one person in the same sense that today that person might have a personal computer or a workstation. The computers that J Japan is talking about would I expect be mainly marketed to the big data processing shops in the major corporations, certainly in Japan, maybe in the US. I haven't seen yet what they're going to do about marketing those computers in the US. But that means that they will be in a situation where they're serving thousands of users. Uh, no doubt the big DP shops that buy those things will benefit. And I expect that they will see a larger market than the Cray and CDC supercomputers will receive because of their compatibility with IBM, especially if that IBM compatibility really proves out. We don't know yet whether complete job streams for an IBM 3081 can be transferred to those machines. 